<laughs> well, welcome back. You're watching Luck on Sunday. But delighted to say that my special guest uh, this week has been with us since the beginning of the programme because we wanted to get his thoughts on all the racing that we've enjoyed from Aintree during the, the past week. He's had a, a fantastic career. It's been a, an up and down career in parts, but now it's firmly stabilised and continuing on the up. He's a grand national winning rider. He started off in this country riding point to point winners and then spent a, a long time with his great mentors, the legendary Robert Allner and his wife Sally. A period of time a stable jockey to Paul Nichols, which culminated in Grand National Glory on Neptune Collange, and now firmly ensconced with the powerful ownership co uh, combination of Simon Munir and Isaac Sweat, for whom he rode Kilda's Art to victory yesterday, but there have been so many more along the way, including So Royal and Bristol de May and many others. He is, of course, Daryl Jacob, who is still with me. Daryl, good to have you, and I hope you've enjoyed the show so far. Yes, it's been excellent. Thank you very much. Good, yeah, good, good. Excellent. And, and actually, I've, I've been really interested listening to, to John Joe Neal Jr. and and Tabitha Worsley there, and two young people at the at the beginning of their careers. And you must watch younger jockeys talk and engage with quite a bit of interest. And it sort of takes you back to when you first landed in England with a with a big future in front of you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, I think even even though for the length of time that I was here, from you know when I was a young lad, I mean, the game the game is always changing, isn't it? And uh, you know, just to hear them too, and, and and also being around the weigh room every every day and listening to to what younger jockeys talk about and the fun and the and the camaraderie that they have, and, and also just to to the to the talent and and, and how they speak and and you know how they approach different races and stuff like that. It's very very interesting because we're in there all all the time. We're in there every day, and you know you can see. You can sort of see being a, a senior jockey, he can see he's got a good brain, he's he's a nice rider, he could go far, he's here today, gone tomorrow kind of way. So it's 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 really interesting, you know, being a younger person and now being one of the, the more senior jockeys, how the whole way room is sort of changing all the time really. And unless you're A.P. McCoy or, or Richard Johnson, the vast majority of jockeys, even when they have the kind of success you've had, have twists and turns and ups and downs, and their career has different chapters and so on and so forth. You seem to be in a, in a pretty stable period of your career, dare I say it, at the moment. You sort of got to a level. Do you, fi do you feel happier with that? Do you feel happier and more, more, more settled with where you are at the moment? I think I'm the happiest person in the way, if I'm being honest with you. For me, personally, I think I've got the best job in England and Ireland. You know, riding for Simon and Isaac and, and Anthony, it's, um, you know, they're three wonderful people that have, have come into my life, and um, I, I think I'm a really, really lucky guy. Because essentially, you know that the horses are generally lovely horses, aren't they? You're, you're, you're riding horses at of significant quality most of the time. Yeah, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very good, they're very, very good horses and, you know, and Anthony does a, does a great job buying them. Is that them. Anthony Bromley, their yeah, racing manager? Um, he does a great job buying them, but the great thing about our, you know, our team is that, you know, we bring these horses, we bring them along, you know, it's, we bring them along for the future, we like them, you, know, you can see with Scoriel, even with Killestart, with Bristol and May, we like them to have the longevity, so, they're always they're always cared for. They're always looked after to, you know, with, with targets in mind and 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 the longevity with them. And 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 Simon and Isaac they they understand that as well. And and that means I can go out there. I can I've got a free reign. I can I can do what I want. I can change tactics when I want. And and the confidence that they give you, the three of them, the confidence that they give you to go out and ride. It's like as if they're say it's, it's nearly like as if you're going out on a day's hunting you go out there you, you first of all you want your horse to enjoy it and then you'll enjoy it and and the whole thing folds really really well so you're just part of the planning process which must give you much deeper satisfaction when you actually walk into the winner's enclosure on one it's not just a question of there's another winner where's my next ride take take the check it's i've i've almost been part of the nurturing process of this yeah Alex, like i've been you know i've been around a lot of these horses bristol since he was a three-year-old top notch you know, Scoriel. I've been around these horses since they were three-year-olds, since they've come over, and um, you know, all these horses—they're nearly like my best friends because I spend a lot of time with them. I mean, I ride out in, in Nicky's and Ben Pauling's, and you know, all these Nigels. I ride out where all our horses are. I ride out, you know, in their yards, and I get to see them, you know, a lot of the time, at least once, if not twice a week, and. I get to school them, I get to work them, I get to do an awful lot of homework with them before they go on a race course and, and then I just fill it back to Anthony and Simon and Isaac and, uh, and like you say, to see them then whenever they come on to a race course and to blossom the way they do, to improve the way yeah. they do, it gives me a lot of satisfaction, it really does. Uh, 
if there are two people watching this program now, I take a, a fair bet they they may be Robert and, and Sally Allner, your your great yeah. mentors and uh, and friends and and people for whom the entire sport has an enormous amount of respect, particularly for Robert after his injury and the way that he's he, he's mm. dealt with that. Um, try and try and tell me why they mean so much to you. Well, I, I call it Robert. I call him the boss. I've always have since since the day I came over here. Um, they're just incredible people. I mean, they've every decision that I've made for my career since since I've come over here has been through the boss and Sally. You know, they when I started out my point point in days, you know, they looked after me. They they gave me the experience that I needed. You know, riding young horses, four year olds over fences, um, and and obviously with the boss, he was he was an exception talent when he was a rider. Um, he was one of the best point to point riders, you know, around the West Country, written numerous big winners. And also as a trainer as well, he was one of the highly respected trainers. And, you know, I remember the day that, you know, the boss, he was, he was schooling, and um, Rob Walford sat on a horse. The horse ran out with Rob, Rob Walford, and then the boss put me on it. It ran out with me um, through the wings, and then the boss sort of lost his head, and uh, he said, Get off it, get off it. And he got on it, and he just. Literally threw the reins at us, um, riding the style that he rode when he was when he was point to point, and the horse just just pinged over all, all three fences. And me and Rob just looked at each other and we just shook our head. And you know, and, but that's the sort of talent the boss was. He was he was, and you can ask Andrew Thornton about him as well. I mean, he's you know Andrew Thornton is you know the boss gave him a really really good career and. You know, he's, he's just an incredible man, really. Do you think if it hadn't been for him and the advice he's given you all the way through your career, you'd be in the place that you're in now? Um, well, actually, I was going to... At one stage, I was actually going to pack it in. I was going to go home and I was going to do do another job. Um, and it was actually him and, and Sally that they persuaded me to stay on. And um, I went back and I had three or four months with them and I ended up picking up the ride on the listener and that was all you know that was all down to them and and sort of the listener then was the first sort of flagship horse that I had the good first good horse that I had um, to go to war with and, and like I say a lot of my career a lot of the decisions that I've made is, is purely down to them and you won three grade ones on him what was it that was not going right for you that made you want to go home um, I just I don't know for some reason I just I just didn't feel comfortable I just I didn't, I probably wasn't in the right spot, I wasn't enjoying it. I think possibly it was because I had two wonderful years with Robert and Sally point to point and you know I went conditioned with Paul Keane and I had a fantastic ten months with Paul Keane but I just didn't feel happy even though I think I had um, something like 11 or 12 winners in that ten months for Paul Keane that, and, and you know plenty of rides, I had a fantastic strike rate but I just wasn't happy, I wasn't content and I'm not sure was it was because the fun that I had the two years Previously, point to point, and the experience that I learned then, it was a totally different ball game going from an amateur to to a conditional. And um, whether I just didn't settle, or whether sort of sounds like I got homesick from being at Robert and Sally's, I've, I've no idea. But I was I was on the verge of going home. I bought the ticket to go home, and thankfully they they got me down there and they changed my mind. And from then on, I just floated really. Are you someone who needs that sense of belonging? You need to be a part of something. I don't know. It's, it's it's a confidence thing, I suppose, and I'm always on like my mum and dad. You know, to, you know, trust is a massive thing. I think if you've got trust in in people, it's a lot easier to get on with them, isn't it? It's a lot easier because you know they're gonna they're gonna watch your back. You can watch their back. But the problem is when you start getting them little doubts about trust. That's when the relationship goes spreads, and all of my successful relationships that I've had. Um, I've, it's always been about trust, and I'm, I'm, I like to say, trust is is a big word for me. And people that I trust, it gels, we click, and we move forward, and it's always been successful. How do you how do you enjoy the limelight? Um, I'm to be fair, I just I like going about my own daily business. I mean, you know, I enjoy. I love doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm not someone that goes out looking for it. I just, I love going racing, I love riding nice horses and I love going home to, to my wife and two kids and I'm happy then and I live out away from from the sort of the racing industry and you know I go, I just, I, just, I enjoy quite life. Mm. I, I suppose I asked that question because y when Ruby Walsh went to, to back to Ireland to, to ride, ex not exclusively for Willie Mullins but he, he gave up the Paul Nichols part of his, his career, you were thrust into the most important job in 
in British National Hunt Racing at the time. Uh, every single National Hunt fan's eyes are on how can Daryl Jacob fill the fill the, uh, the boots of Ruby Walsh. Uh, you yourself gave a very articulate, um, passionate compliment to, to, to Ruby Walsh's ability earlier on. That that must have been insanely difficult at the time. Well, it was, it was, it was obviously difficult because obviously Paul had a, a transition period as well with the horses. He didn't have quite as good a horse as, as he was had when, when obviously Ruby was there and it was a transition period you know some of the horses weren't and you know at the time he needed to rebuild um, his sort of squad and you know and it, it's a bit like I put it into a it's a bit like David Moyes taking over Sir Alex Ferguson it was you know David Moyes was never ever going to be Sir Alex Ferguson he's a very very talented thing but it's just you know everything that probably David Moyes think when it was always would Ruby have done this, or would Sir Alex would have done this? And that was a little bit the same with me, but something I was very, very proud of is that that, that year that I was with Paul, I made him champion trainer with, with the quality that we didn't quite have. You know, he was still champion trainer, and for me that was, you know, I feel very proud of that. I feel very honoured to that the one year I was with him that he was champion trainer. And you got a Grand National winner out of it. Yeah. Which, we, no, yeah. which no one can ever take away from you, even if it was only by that much. No, exactly, yeah. That must have been a... An extraordinary day, because as you said, it had been a it had been a high octane season, a sort of high pressure season, a high octane season. It's a good job the photo went the right way for you. Yeah, obviously, um, yeah, I suppose it was. I mean, you look at every jockey, you know, they, when they start riding racehorses, that's the you know one race do we want to be involved in, you know, and to get to get a ride. I remember the first ride that I had was was Filson Run. In 2007, for Nick Williams, Nick Williams who was, yeah. who was, I was, I, I was attached to for four years, four magic years with him, and um, he was 100 to one. My first ride in the race, and I was absolutely buzzing. You know, I, I just, you know, to, it's a jockey's dream to, you know, to be associated with, and then obviously the more rides you get, in, you know, the more you want to win it, and it's something that's on my CV now, and it's, some, it's a day I'll never ever forget. And on a on a proper horse as well, Neptune Kalaja, really yeah. one of the classiest winners of of the modern era. Yeah, it was it was it was the only time I actually ever rode him. Um, Harry Durham used to ride him a bit as well, and Harry Durham gave him a great ride at Haydock as his prep run. And uh, you know, I got on him. Obviously, Ruby decided to ride one for for Willie that year, and um, you know, looking enough, I got I got the call up, and uh, you know, he super he jumped great, got me out of a lot of trouble, and uh, like I say, he was a class horse. He, he finished third in the Gold Cup, didn't he? So um, mm. he's a very, very good horse. And when you when you then became the sort of fully fledged first first rider, if you will, there was that there was that Cheltenham Festival where you were you were desperate for a winner and you were trying and trying and trying and one or two things hadn't gone your way. And there was the the famous I'm sure you don't play this one back too many times. The famous photo finish against Richard Johnson at the end of the at the end of Pate the Potemps where you went down mm. very narrowly. And we as a TV audience got to see your kind of emotions in the roar, if you like, and that that was a very, very painful experience for you, wasn't it? Yeah, it should look, it's, it's tough, isn't it, Cheltenham? Everyone wants to ride winners there, and when you, when you go down by a nose or whatever it is, it's it's a tough pill to swallow, because, like you say, it's, it's our Olympics. So, you know what I mean? The, you know, having a winner there is the difference between having a good season and a bad season. And... Um, I think that year, I think that was that was my second or third second, and uh, it was just it was a tough pill to swallow because I thought I gave the horse a great ride. I produced him when I wanted. Everton, you know, Everton was just uh, exactly the way I wanted to do. But it's just, I mean, Richard Johnson, the strongest man in the way room, and he got a little bit more out of his horse than than what I got out of mine. And um, you know, that's why Richard Johnson is champion jockey for the last four years now, isn't he? So. And I, th I think what what strikes me now is that if that same thing happened now, you wouldn't be reacting in the same way because you feel you just feel better about the way you're doing things. Yeah, but yeah, but I still I've, like even at Cheltenham this year we had a couple of short, you know, short. We got beaten, you know, a couple of short distance again this year. And um, as you get older, obviously, you know, you can stomach things or you can control your emotions a little bit better, but. Um, it's still it's still a very very tough pill to swallow when you get beaten in a narrow distance and and even still it hurts me now. And uh, as far as um, your your transition out of the Nichols job was concerned, just talk me through the the mechanics of that. So you 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 split with Paul. You were having some desperate injury luck at the time. Where did you think the future was going to go at that point? Um, 
I wasn't quite sure at the at the time, obviously, um, you know. But um, you know, I was obviously injured after after my horse ran into a camera. Yeah. Um, and sort of obviously then Sam took over, and um, and it was just a lovely phone call when when um, I was in hospital from from Simon Manier, and um, he gave me a ring and we had a chat, and he just said to me, he said, look at it. I'd love to help you in, in any way I could. Um, I'd ridden a couple of horses for him, and um, when I was with Paul's, and the it sort of that phone call led to another phone call, and obviously I got offered Connors had offered me the the role with riding cue card and mm. and and stuff like that. So you know that qu when when that was happening, everything sort of happened quite quickly. So and I wanted to get back as quick as I could as well, obviously because the injuries weren't great. I wanted to get back as quick as I could because. You know, we're losing the job, and then you know, I wanted to get back out as quick as I could, just to to try and get going again as quick as I could. And look at him very again, going back to to the boss and Sally. You know, great mentors. You know, cuddled me through it, nurtured me through it, and. Um, so you put it. So in that time, so yeah, how long were you in hospital with the? Because it was a, it was a horrible incident at, at Cheltenham when you went into the camera on Paul Mellon. Mm. How long were you in laid up for? Um, I think originally. The doctors said it was going to be probably with all, with all the injuries. It was probably going to be. It was they were looking at sort of ten to eleven months. Mm. But you had a, you had a, a spell in hospital, didn't you? Which was yeah, we were in hospital for a little bit. Yeah. but um, that's part and parcel of the game, isn't yeah. it? We we got out of there, and you know from that point, all I wanted to do is to look forward to getting back as soon as I can. I think I came back within I think it was five and a half months. But in that in that very short spell straight after the fall, you've managed to lose a job, gain another job. Get it right on cue card. It was a, a pretty mad time. Yeah, it was. It, it, like I say, it all happened very, very sort of quickly. But you know, look at that's the way racing is. Look, mm. one door closes, another door opens, and you see it happening every day of the week then in, in racing. And that's just the na nature of the game, isn't it? Were you surprised when Simon Manier phoned you? Um, I was. Uh, yeah, I was to be fair because, uh, like I say, I didn't have many dealings with him. But it just goes to show what a lovely man Simon and Isaac are. I mean, Dave. You know, he's he's a genuine, very, very genuine man, and um, it it just sort of steamrolled from there. And, and like you said, we're very, very lucky. We've got Anthony Romney as well. So um, I always like to look forward. I always like to look at the positive stuff. And for me, you know, the three of them people coming into my life at at that time was was very, very important. And that's that is a an incredibly strong relationship as well. Just the way that they talk about you as well. It's you know you don't often see that between. Owners and jockeys, I don't think. Maybe you do with trainers and jockeys sometimes. No, it's, it, like I say, it's it's been a wonderful relationship, isn't it? I mean, it's just gone from from strength to strength, and we put a lot of trust into the work that we do. And we're all we're all there to do um, a job. We all want winners, but we all want the horses looked after and for them to enjoy the races and and um, you know and for the future as well. So we all work very very hard, um, and we all work together. And it it very nearly. Came came off in the Gold Cup this year with with Old Bristol De May, who everyone had not written off, but no one really thought he was going to win the Gold Cup. Two out, I thought he was going to win the Gold Cup. I bet you did as well. Yeah, I thought for a glimmer. I thought I thought we had a chance um, going down, going, jumping two out. But um, look, the horse ran a mar marvelous race. He put his heart and his soul into that race, and uh, it's nice because a lot of people think he's a, a Haydock specialist and stuff like that. And look, and Haydock suits him really well. Don't get me wrong. But you know he has won on undulating tracks before in the past, and we've always said at Bristol May he's, he's he's not the easiest horse to to keep right. And I think Nigel and Sparky have done a, a magnificent job with him. But when the horse is right, he's a very very talented horse, and uh, you know it's it, it, it's he's just a, unfortunately just not the easiest horse to keep right. But he's he's unbeatable at Haydock in November. That's one thing that we do know. He's a fresh horse, isn't he? He's mm. a very, very fresh horse. He's come back from his summer holidays. He's feeling really well in himself. And I think with this year, we've we've obviously trained him a lot differently. We've had a lot of chats about him. We've trained him differently. Obviously, he won us. He went to the Haydock. He won a Haydock. And then we, we you know, with the with the million pound bonus, we we, we gave it a go at Kempton. It didn't quite work out. Um, but in theory, he went to he went to Cheltenham with just having yeah. the one run under his belt, and he you know he arguably probably nearly ran to a career best at Cheltenham. So, but he did finish second in the JLT around there before when he was a novice. So, um, it just really worked from that day at, at Cheltenham, and uh, you know we're learning about the horse as well. Even though the horse is an eight-year-old, he seems to be around forever, but he's only an eight-year-old, and we are still learning about the horse.
and it, it always makes me smile how how cross you can make Nigel by suggesting that he can only run around a dog, light the blue touch paper and, and watch him go. But you must see it all the time. You're running for such a variety of trainers now, how passionate they get about their horses. Yeah, no, he's a very, very passionate man, isn't he? He's always, he's very, um, very exuberant. He's, you know, he's always, you know, this will win, this will win. But he's a fantastic trainer. He does a great job, with, but especially with Simon and Isaac's horses. And, um, you know, he's a very, very good trainer. Do you? It's quite an unusual role, I suppose, in a sense. Do you? Do you have to understand the the language of each trainer, if you like? Because some are pessimists, some are natural optimists, others are somewhere between the two. Some give you instructions, probably others don't give you instructions. Is it? Do you quite enjoy sort of like managing all those little micro relationships along the way? Yeah, I enjoy it because like all of our all of our trainers and and all of the trainers are right for it. They've all got different personalities, haven't they? So. You know, you're, you're you're learning from each personality, and you're learning the way each trainer likes their horses ridden, or how you know each trainer likes to do things and stuff like that. And for me, it, it's it's brilliant because um, you know I get to go in and 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 see the horses, see the trainers, and you know, and, and the trainers are very lucky, I suppose. They've got some really nice horses as well, and it obviously makes it makes it a little bit easier as well, doesn't it? It certainly does. And as far as a, an imminent. If there's one thing you really love to achieve for those owners, what would it be? Grand National. I know Simon and I would love to, love to win a Grand National, and uh, if I could do that for them, um, I think it'd be, I'll never ever better. That'd be by far the, the biggest highlight in my entire life. It'd be, it'd be just magic. Daryl, for the moment, thank you very much. Daryl Jacob, uh, who rejoins us uh, after this break. Uh, we are going to leave you just for the moment uh, with some of the sights and sounds from Aintree, but do rejoin us when uh, Dave Yates will be back in the studio as well.